Hey, this is John Reed, and I am joined by Jeff Scott and Josh Greenbaum, and not for the first time. Oh my gosh, we are going to get in some trouble today because we are talking about the role of partners in SAP innovation. What could go wrong, guys? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm I'm hiding behind a microphone, John, uh, for fear of where this is going to go. In an undisclosed location, no less. Yes. In an in a private in a private under underground bunker. So, just for a little bit of context on this, we have recorded a whole series of podcasts now, and we had this is like kind of a third in a series on SAP innovation. And at the end of the last one, it just kind of felt like, well, we're leaving partners out. And as Josh will probably get into at some point, this is a common flaw in how we talk about SAP projects and SAP success, which is ultimately what I think we're all after. So with Sapphire and ASUG annual conference right around the corner in Orlando, we need to really get to the bottom of this. And, you know, partners can either, I think, be an engine for success for projects or they can really be a blocker and uh, within with the innovation strategy changing so drastically with things like clean core and ai it's never been more important i think to talk about how partners fit into this mix that's what we're going to do today and uh there's just a couple of ground rules we've imposed upon ourselves for this conversation one is that we are not going to name try not to name any partners but basically if you're not named don't take it personal there's a lot of great SAP partners out there, but we don't want to do a lot of name dropping. And second, we're not going to spend much time on on the big SIs in this discussion. We could spend a lot of time on the big SIs, obviously, guys. <laughs> we could spend a whole podcast on that. But I uh, feel like a lot of people sort of understand the pros and cons of what the big SIs are all about. Um, obviously, the big SIs played a really crucial role in the expansion of SAP back in the 90s uh, through the business process reengineering days. and. The tricky thing with some of the big firms is some of them are per- arguably more powerful than SAP at certain junctures. And so that creates a lot of tricky aspects for project quality and stuff like that. But that's kind of a whole separate discussion. And Josh actually presented a definition of partners for us that we're kind of going to try to loosely adhere to. And Josh wrote, uh, I think this should be specific to different partner types we might want to limit. Uh, to small to mid-sized vendors that do tools, industry geo-specific, and implementations and such. So that's kind of a a broad view of what we're going to try to look at. And that also obviously includes ISVs of various kinds as well. So that's that's it for me. But but one thing I will say is our goal here, we're going to have this unscripted conversation, but our goal towards the end is to try to then shoehorn this into how should partners respond to these changes? And then most importantly, how should customers and ASUG members respond to what we've learned about the role of partners. So I'm going to turn it over to, to you, Jeff, because uh, at ASUG, you, you all deal with a lot of partners and you have a lot of interesting challenges around how to constructively fit partners into conversations. So what are your first thoughts on this topic? Walk carefully is the first thought I have on the topic, John. Um, but without exception, and, and actually I shouldn't say without exception, I've only come across maybe one or two customers who have been able to accomplish significant change on their own without a partner being involved. So clearly, the minority of customers are able to do things without some degree of partner enablement occurring, which means that almost everything the average customer does inside of an SCP ecosystem necessitates, requires, demands some degree of partner help. As you pointed out, there are a lot of different flavors of partners. To make this even slightly more complicated, they aren't individually mutually exclusive columns. They kind of intersect with each other. So when you're talking about services partners, when you're talking about value-added software partners, when you're talking about partners who can help you with strategic consulting, when you're talking about partners that can help you with acquisition of of software and those types of things, they, they, they are all over the place. And that makes the life of the technology teams inside of ASUG member companies challenging, right? Because how do I figure out who is the right partner to use? So much of this ecosystem is built on longstanding relationships that are embedded in the bedrock of trust. Many CIOs bring those relationships with them as they move from organization to organization to organization. But today, 
we are under a tremendous amount of tectonic change in how SAP is migrating and transforming its software to fit a modern day view of enterprise architecture. That doesn't mean that every single partner is up to speed in what that is and what that does and how to be the best partner at that, which then brings us back to the customer base saying, your ability to choose the very best partner at the very best point in time to achieve those ends and those outcomes is more critical than ever and quite frankly, more complicated than ever. How about that? Sounds good to me. So I have a number of of points that I kind of want to rattle off fairly early on that I, I started listing them as biases, and they might not be biases as much as principles, but there's one that ties into what Jeff just said that I want to run by you, Josh, and then you can kind of kick things off because I know you spend a ton of time with various kinds of partners in this SAP quote unquote ecosystem, which one of my least favorite words, but I just used it. So there you go. Uh, you have a better what, word? Uh, solar system with solar, SAP okay. is the sun. Ecosystem. Um, ecosystem. Yeah, I, I know the ecosystem is popular. I like solar system because I think that's actually accurate. Not And by the way, not just for SAP, but for most large vendors. Right. The, the sun gives all the warmth and we have to deal with that one way or the other. But and anyway. a ton of radiation, John. Yes, you do have to put sunscreen. You, get. you do have to put Closer sunscreen on at times. That that is true. So, so Josh, one of my little biases and principles here is that I think customers historically have not casted a wide enough net for partners, and that there's a lot of amazing partners out there that don't get enough visibility for customers. A lot of them are are, are very niche and specialized, and really punch above their weight. And I think that that's become increasingly important now with the changes that Jeff described, where there's partners that are really on board with certain kinds of modernization efforts and other partners that are not. And so part of the problem that I see with the customer dynamic is that most customers do have a vendor approval process. And as Jeff said, they have relationships built up. And so it's really easy to kind of stick with what you know. And and to some extent, that's not bad because you trust those partners. But my view is that it's never been more important to kind of really think about what else is out there. That doesn't mean you would abandon your current ones, but it does mean you need to, I think customers need a much deeper awareness of the kinds of partners that are out there. So I'm going to put that over to you and just riff on this and take us somewhere. Well, you know, and, and, and again, I, I think we need to start relatively quickly with, you know, defining the different kinds of partners because it's really essential to to look at as customers move forward and, and try to sort of bridge these innovation gaps, they're going to need different kinds of partners with different kinds of roles. So, you know, SAP sort of separates it into a a four-part taxonomy, build partners, sell partners, service partners, and run partners. I have a larger one that's about six or eight. <clears throat> but fundamentally, you've got a partner, you know, you're going to need partners to help you implement. Uh, you're going to need partners to manage service partners, for example, to help you run the darn thing. Um, and But you also, and I think this is becoming more and more critical, you're going to need partners that can really help you with kind of the long tail of innovation. Uh, one of the problems with clean core, fit to standard, is that, you know, you really, SAP is really forcing, ironically, kind of a standardization effort inside the the core of ERP. It is no longer differentiating, uh, or shall we say, the more you do that, particularly in the grow world of, of, of SAS, S4 HANA, you don't really differentiate in ERP. So you have to differentiate at the edge. The edge is going to be owned by what? Um, the edge in, might be another piece of SAP software. More and more, as you get into this, again, long tail of innovation specific to your industry and your geography, you're going to want to find a partner partner product, a piece of software that does something in particular, particular, a partner who can help you define the tax and you know, regulatory problems uh, that you've got uh, in, your industry, in, in your industry and geography. So, so you know, to your question that you posed to me, let me try to answer that specifically. Customers really need to have a a wider net. They need to think bigger and more strategically about the different kinds of partners, plural, that they need. And it's not just one of one of any of individual type. It may be more than one. In particular, if you have again, you have a business that extends outside of the you know the 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 geographical boundaries of your headquarters, you may need a lot of partners. Um, so I, I think it's 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 gotten more complicated. And I'll just add that SAP, of course complicates everything even further by setting up 
for instance, you know, terms and conditions in the SAP store for selling in the store that actually are quite mm. off-putting to some of these very sm important small and medium-sized partners because because it's so disadvantageous. So sometimes these partners are hard to find. So you've got to cast a wide net and you've got to do it strategically and you can't necessarily count on just one click. Here they are, SAP will help you find the perfect partner. Not going to happen necessarily. I, I have but, a couple of follow-ups if I might on that. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I'm Josh, spot on. Secondly, I don't know that customers understand that in order for partners to be even on the store, they have to make concessions to SAP to be there. So there is a back channel monetization happening, right? Which I think customers don't always understand. But if you think about the Apple store or the Android store, and you think about that mo model, it's being extended into the SAP store as well, right? So understand that some of this is happening that way. The, the other thing that I think, as you were talking, that kind of came to mind is there's another force in play here that I don't think we've seen as prevalent in the past. And that is the role of the large strategic consulting firms thinking in much broader terms about innovation, strategy. They're not getting involved necessarily in software selection, but they're thinking long and hard about the overall spend and how does this impact and how do you make how does an organization make big strategic commitments to certain areas? So you're seeing some of those capabilities start to come in, which is a little different than what we've seen historically. So they're kind of coming in from the top level, middle level, and, and low level. And those strategic consultants aren't, aren't, doing, aren't doing execution. They're basically kind of architecting an architect. I, don't, I want to use the art word architecting in a very esoteric way, not how we would typically think about it insofar as you know, enterprise architecture. They're kind of thinking about business architecture. And then making recommendations to senior leadership, the CEOs, the boards about how some of this stuff should be worked through. And finally, I was in a, I was uh, with a number of SAP customers over the past couple months in in some forums, and what a light bulb went off for me. I started listening to the stories of all of these customers, and many of them are not using one partner. To your point, Josh, they're using multiple ones. And they are switching partners during implementation cycles and not for necessarily the right reasons. They're switching them because they recognize they made a mistake or that partner wasn't able to deliver the outcome that they were looking for and they made a switch. And it kind of made a light bulb go off in my head that that's really costly. And if you're not really going into these arrangements with the right frame of mind at the beginning, you may have to back up and go again. And if you're not anticipating that, that is a lot of lost time. So, and money and risk and people looking and saying, I'm sorry, you did what? Right? Yeah, it's, it, it's uh, uh, yellow, yellow flashing, red flashing lights going off. So I want to talk a little bit about disruption in the service industry in a broader sense to frame our discussion, but also specifically around clean core and how disruptive that is to traditional partner business models. And then hear what you all think. My, my contention is that the services industry on the enterprise software side is in dire need of way more disruption than it's happened. The, the major thing that changed uh, over all these years since the heyday of SAP R3 was the outsourcing industry, which was arguably, arguably a form of cost arbitrage rather than an improvement in the customer experience. And that's really been the main change that happened. But now the outsourcing industry is fairly disrupted, especially by automation, but eventually by AI. Though we could, I think, have a conversation at some point about whether AI is really going to make the customer experience better, whether we're automating the right things to make to reduce the friction of, say, migrations, for example. But anyway, my thing is like the services industry just doesn't seem to be nearly as disrupted as the software industry has been. So, for example, like where are the value based models? Where are the skin in the game models? Where are the services on demand models? There's so much change that hasn't happened in the <clears throat> service industry overall that I think is really interesting. But one thing that has changed is the SaaS software model really put a microscope on consulting costs because classic ERP implementations on-premise had, you know, consulting cost ratios of sometimes 1 to 15 even or 1 to 20. And in the SaaS model, it's understood that you can't really go beyond 1 to 1 or 1 to 2. <laughs> which is still a big challenge in the SAP space, but at least it holds a benchmark and a microscope up to what the cost should really be. But my thing is like, I think more than anything, you need a partner in innovation, which is what we're talking about, not a co low cost partner necessarily, 
but someone who can help you move forward. And when you look at the clean core and all these companies that are going to be doing these end of maintenance upgrades, the type of upgrade you choose and why you do it is so critically important. And you need a partner that can give you the right advice and, and, and help carry that forward. And, you, and a lot of partners are used to just taking all this custom code and saying, yeah, I'll take your custom code project happily, whatever you want. And what SAP is saying is you're in a lot of trouble if you do that, because that's going to take you away from this clean core that you need. And while not every customer is going to embrace that, that is where SAP is headed and where it's pushing both both customers and partners. So what do you make of all that? Like, how, how do we think about partners in this context? Um, wow, John, that's a lot. So uh, first of all, I, I don't believe the market, I, for, the market forces that you're describing have not seemed to taken root inside of some of the traditional partners you're discussing, right? And why is that? Why are we still relying on time and material-based contracts? To your point, ASUG research demonstrates over and over again that the multiplier on implementation cost is 10 to 12 to 15 times. 15 I haven't seen, but I'll, I'll go with your number because it's in that range. It's a significant material cost to moving forward on these systems. I would even suggest to you becoming unaffordable for most organizations because if you can't figure out business value, a 12x multiplier is a really big hurdle to get over. Now, why is that occurring? Well, first and foremost, if you're going to say to organizations, you need to redo your business processes to get back to standard or clean core, that is a massive amount of process work. And while you can automate some of that, there is a lot of work that has to happen on the ground with your operating teams to get them to buy into a new process. I think we've all been around projects that just basically create a new process out of thin air and then say to the operating teams, this is super clear to us, go do it. And they look at you and go, I don't understand this, right? And then everything grinds to a halt. Right. And, and, you know, all of a sudden you're not shipping, you're not billing, you're not, you're not creating invoices, right? You're not, you're not paying bills because your business processes are not thought through. So there's that risk. Right. And I think the other thing that kind of is a, is a, is a, is an, an, is an, an opposing force to this is there's a lot of risk in these projects and most consulting firms, it's not a turnkey. You know, they're like, Hey, I'll do this for you, but I don't know what we're getting into. It's like, you know, when you, you know, you take an old house, this old house, and you go, hey, we could take those walls down until you take a sledgehammer to it. And you go, oh, wait, whoa, that's what's in that wall? Oh, I didn't realize that was a load-bearing wall. Uh-oh, right? So, uh, you know, th there's a lot of that going on. This is very complicated. Um, I, I want to point the finger, unfortunately, at our friends at SAP a little bit, because I think they have really enabled the model, particularly the top tier as systems integrator model to continue to be the dominant model. In fact, you know, well, I, I sort of, to be very open and controversial, maybe or maybe not, I breathed a real sigh of relief when there was a sudden change of heart about who was going to run the supervisory board at SAP because there was a large SI, large SI who was going to do that. I think, I think they're, they are, and, and, you know, it's complicated. They have a lot of account control more than SAP in many cases. But when you look at how SAP's partner program has been run and continues to be run traditionally, it it has you know there are there are four different kinds of partners and four different kinds of tiers, et cetera, et cetera. But there's really only you know there's only one you know first among equals, and that's the global SIs, and then everything else sort of trickles down from there. So I think I think SAP has to really and or maybe I'll throw the challenge to to you, Jeff, or the user community has to really you know kind of force this bit a little bit because. This lack of a uh, la lack of alternatives in terms of how we work uh, in 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 both implementing. I think it's mostly about implementation managing projects as opposed to you know coming up with cool in innovative software. But for the most part, that that you know that is just stagnant and it's stagnant because I think that you know the number one enabler is SAP itself. Um, having said that, you know I think that. Ironically, the, for customers who really care to take a close, careful look at their options, the good news is that there are a lot of smaller boutique partners who really do a damn good job and who really can 
um, you know, can differentiate on quality and, and success rates and on cost effectiveness. Um, and, you know, and some of them are, some of them are out there doing, yeah, doing a different thing. So I, I think it's very possible, but I think we need change, you know, at the, it takes three, three parties, right. To do this, you need a partner, you need a, you need a customer, you need a, you need a vendor. And I think if one, if the, if one of those isn't doing anything or two in this case, because the partners don't want to do anything, maybe it's up to the user community to really start, start, you know, making a little noise about it. But so Josh, Josh there, there have I'll been wild ahead. swings. There have been wild swings here to your point, right? And, and they're, they're vacillating in front of our eyes, which also makes this very complicated and, and maybe even frustrating. You know, swings number one is SAP in the services space or out, and and you know that's yes. been flip flopping back and forth, right? Swing number two, um, who's really responsible for value added functionality? SAP has been inconsistent in which of the functionality are they going to sponsor, and what are they giving back to the partners to do, right? And that is all over the place, and it seems to me based on random criteria that are shifting all the time whether certain functionality is going to deliver through the partner ecosystem or it's going to be actually authored and championed by SAP. And so the customer is kind of sitting at the end of this and going, well, wait a minute, what am I supposed to be buying? Who am I buying it from? Why, you know, well, I thought SAP was providing it. No, wait a minute, one of the biggest SIs is providing it. Well, wait a minute, who, which SI is providing it? And who does my services? Who am I, you know, when this gets really hard, do I, do I rely on SAP for services when I can't get this stuff to work? Do I rely on the, the partners? The partners are blaming SAP. SAP is blaming the partners. Ah, uncle. Yeah. And yeah. there's that thing we talked about on the thread, ODP. You know, then the SAP changes the games game on an API and all of a sudden all, you know, all hell breaks loose in terms of what partners are able to do for customers and what customers have invested in. Sorry, John. Right. Go ahead. So um Josh, you made an interesting point about the supervisory board change, and we don't need to talk about that much today, but I do th it kind of reinforces my thinking, which is like I didn't like the big SI background of that particular individual that is no longer going to serve because it, again, I just don't feel like the innovation and the cutting edge stuff is coming from from that area with big SIs yet. I've, the new person that's been put forward has more of a next-gen tech background and fresh, to me on paper, fresher ideas, which I think some of these firms will eventually get around to. I mean, obviously, some of these firms have come a long way in terms of some of them actually are doing a really good job on developing apps on BTP, for example, and they have the resources to do that. So it's not like they're completely out of sync. But you know, one thing I wanted to talk about in this context is customer choice and why I think customers need to really take a look at partners in terms of Rise in particular, because right now we're still in the middle of an ongoing debate with SAP around whether Rise should be considered mandatory for delivery of future innovations such as AI and stuff like that. And when when Rise first came out, I heard from a lot of partners who had issues with Rise, but then over time I saw a lot of partners saying, "Well, we're going to offer this where it's a good fit," which I personally like that move, and I, I like the stance of partners who are agnostic. It can sit down with customers and say, "Here's a bunch of options. If you want to go Rise, here's how that's going to work." If you don't want to do Rise, but you still want to do some hyperscaler stuff on your own, here's how that would work. Those are really beneficial discussions, but I would urge customers, if you're going to go down that route, to also have a talk with your SAP folks about how you're going to access future innovations, just to make sure that you're clear on how that's going to work, because that that hasn't been resolved yet. And you don't want to look back a couple of years down the road and be like, damn, I took John's advice and I went agnostic. And and now I don't have access to the stuff I need. And I don't want to hear hear from you by email if that's the case. But anyway, I'd love to kind of hear what you all have to say about that because I think this is considered the path forward for in delivery of innovation at the way SAP presents it now. So innovation. Yeah, yeah. Josh. But well, 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 you know, I I, I mean Happily, I, if I may use that word, um, Rise is evolving itself or innovating itself. So it's it's and and that makes it a force. You know that that's um, that's which that, we covered a little bit in our last podcast. By the right. way, we we talked we talked a little bit. We won't go a deep dive in that today, but you know, basically more of the transformation services, more of the Lean IX Signavio components, more of a true transformation services approach. Anyway, yeah, but but you know, and so. To a certain extent, rise, you know, rise 
to rise or not to rise is, is still an interesting question. And, and unfortunately, as, as you alluded to, the, the issue of AI innovation is still complicated um, uh, because it's, it's while well, SAP is making a very clear mandate that you cannot get AI innovation without rise, there's lots of cases where you can. Um, and yeah. we were on a briefing recently uh, regarding some CX-related uh, functionality where if you wanted to do that interesting you know, thing with uh, in the CX world with with AI, you could draw data out of any system, R3, PCC, or or Oracle for that matter, and 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 use the AI functionality in SAP, and that meant you know you could do things without rise. So I think they've complicated that particularly. And I think the other thing is though they are continuing to SAP is continuing to add more pieces to rise and more parts of the portfolio to rise. Back to my you know initial point, there's a this long tail of innovation that has nothing to do with something you're going to get in a RISE contract, except for the fact that you're going to have to make sure you've got the right BTP components in your RISE contract, and that's not obvious necessarily, so that you're going to do the right integration. To yeah, I want to get to I want to get to BTP easier. in a, I want to get to BTP in a second, but Josh, I want to turn this around on you a little bit in terms of customer advice. So wouldn't you say then that if customers are looking at partners for projects such as migrations where cloud migrations where rise is a factor, that they need to be asking these kinds of questions of their partners and kind of getting a sense of how familiar partners are with this sort of new version of rise that, you know, a more modern version of rise and how what their stance is and isn't that really important to get a comfort level with your partner on that? I think the biggest risk with, with rise right now from when I'm hearing from customers and partners is that there's a risk of a bad rise contract to be very blunt. You don't necessarily know a priori what you need. There's a lot of a tons of you know terms and conditions and bits and pieces. How much, you know, like I said, how much BTP you're going to get? What are you going to get? You know, which which parts of you know of Signavio are part of your rise card and which parts do you have to contract separately for? And so I think the you know one of the major risks is is if you don't have a partner who's well versed in the these these minutiae and understands the contracting side of rise as well as the impl- you know the product side of rise you're at risk of finding yourself down the road 6 8 10 months from now and missing something and Josh those are two very different skills you just identified there right the partners who have knowledge of how rise is architected and how to best facilitate your rise purchase that is a very important skill and then once that's done the partners who can actually implement slash execute your vision of what you want to do as far as a migration is concerned towards your future state. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that this is a very new territory, not just for the customer base, but I'll submit to you for SAP as well, right? That we are moving into a consumption-based, services-based pricing model that no one has a lot of experience with. So every customer should be very hypervigilant about what they need, how they need it, and create protections in that agreement when it goes wrong. Because I think it will go wrong. Because no one can possibly understand all the pushes and pops and pulls of a modern day, multi-tiered architecture, sitting in a cloud provider, provisioned through SAP, consumption-based model. It is a brand new frontier for all of us. I want to back up maybe about three steps and come back to innovation. We talked about this on a prior podcast. I wholeheartedly believe that innovation is the responsibility of the customer to understand what do you want to innovate? Where do you want to get better? It's your business, not SAPs and not the partners. So where do you want to innovate and then make the choices about how you want to affect that innovation. I don't particularly subscribe to a notion that you have to necessarily accept someone else's innovation. You can accept how they want you to innovate, but the innovation responsibility and accountability is yours as a customer. What does your business need? How is, it, how is it stacking up against its competitors? How do you make sure you're providing the very best service, the very best product, the very best price to drive more market share? Innovate to that. Not because SAP or Oracle or ServiceNow or UiPath or 
blah, 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 blah. So, SIs are so, telling you so to do Jeff, it. So, Jeff, I, I agree and disagree, and I don't want to rehash our conversation because right. we had a really long one. We had a really long one on that. Um, but but don't, wouldn't you say that what you just said does have a big implication on SAP partner selection, right? Because you want to choose a partner that is aligned with the innovation strategy that you've embraced inside and outside of SAP, right? So that's big. Right. And it may not be just one partner, John. It, it may be, you know, a, a series of them because I think you're right. And, and Josh, you said this earlier, there's a lot of expertise at a niche level. I think the general practitioner, right, is, is one strategy, but so much of this is in flight right now. So much of this is moving around that sometimes a, a, someone who's got a very special knowledge in a niche area might actually bring you better solutions. But Jeff, I do, Jeff, I do want to point out to you, though, that if you decide as an SAP customer that you want to consume a certain set of AI services through SAP, the standard talking point from SAP is that you do need to consume that through RISE. And so if you don't want to do RISE, but you do want to consume that innovation, all I'm saying is you need to get some good answers. And I believe you probably will find a way to do it the way Josh described, you know, even if you yeah. don't go RISE. But that's, that's now on the customer to kind of satisfy themselves on that before they enter into these decisions where they say, well, I'm not doing RISE. They need to understand they're going to get what they need. Like, like to your point, they can get AI from elsewhere. They can innovate elsewhere. But if they do want to consume SAP's AI innovation, it's perfectly appropriate for a customer to ask, how am I going to do this if I'm not doing RISE? It's just appropriate for them to ask that. And, and there's ways of doing it. And in fact, what's interesting is that a lot of times this comes through BTP not through Rise specifically. And so choosing a partner that really knows how to use BTP effectively to, to, to access yeah. cloud services can be very important. And I want to just briefly mention that in the context of ASUG Tech Connect, because one of the cool things about that show, which debuted this last fall, and we were all there, and we did a review of that show as well, is there were some BTP services partners on the ground, either focusing on BTP or they were able to speak to that and that was really cool because that was one of the first times that I really saw services partners leading with that and, and engaging with customers around it. Now, arguably, we need a lot more of that, but I really thought it was cool that you all are surfacing that because I think those are really important conversations. Right. I, I want to push back a little bit on what Jeff said about it's incumbent on the customer to know where to go. And I say that because I think, you know, first of all, and I've been looking very closely at the the, the dismal state of the up, you know the S4 HANA and ECC upgrade market, and there's a lot of customers fantastically behind in their upgrades, and and really you know which is a whole other whole other podcast. But what I found, uh, for instance, let's go to Tech Connect. I mean, we ran into not one but two AS400 customers there trying to get off of an AS400. I would argue that while you're right, Jeff, it's incumbent on them to know what they want to do, how they want to innovate, I would also guess they're probably a little handicapped in terms of knowing the full range of capabilities that uh, a modern, you know, cloud-based ERP system can, can offer. So I think it's, 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 it's definitely the customer's job to understand as much as possible. But I think there is a place for a, a partner, and again, of these, this myriad, you know, partner types, maybe that's a you know, more of what I call the advisory service or the or the management consultant partner to come in and say, let's tell you what it takes to create an innovative, you know, supply chain in your industry uh, and and therefore drive an innovative customer experience because you may not really know what's lit what's what's what what the art of the possible is today. Josh, I agree with you. Finally. So, so Jeff, I want to ask you mortalized words. Jeff, I want yeah. to ask you in terms of what you what you you refer to some of the data that ASUC produces, and you all have done some really interesting studies on this. But in general, what are what are customers asking AS, asking of ASUC right now in terms of engaging with partners when they come to you on this? What what what's on their minds? Who do I use? Who who? How do I even begin to understand the scope of what's available to me out there? To the extent, as we talked about at the top of the, the conversation today, John, to the extent that I'm even willing to step outside my box of safety, because I have a partner that I've always used, and I think they're good enough. And I think there's a lot that's happening right now around that, that I think is potentially problematic, because you have to verify that that partner has the future skills you need to get you where you need to go. 
Um, so this is on future, yes. Yeah, and it's you know there's a like we've talked about. I mean, BTP, clean. I mean, we're going to throw lots of acronyms out here that have that have absolutely foundationally shook how we used to always do this. BTP, clean core, S4 HANA, right? You know, artificial intelligence. Right? You get throw all these acronyms out. I mean, I firmly believe that we are actually operating in more complicated times than we ever have in the past. That the pathways for forward are more varied, and probably more dangerous than they were for those who preceded, right? So how do you make heads or tails of all of this, right? We talked about, I mean, all roads lead to rise. I think for most customers, right, the only way to move forward with an SCP landscape is through rise. Fine, we can, I don't want to get into that debate at the moment. But even when you say the word rise, you could be talking about a vastly different setup of what that means, Right? How much of RISE do you need? How much BTP do you need? How much S4 HANA do you need? How many app servers do you need? Right? It's not as if you just dial a few dials. You're dialing a lot of dials, and those dials have monetary consequences. Did you make the right call? What if you didn't? What's your downside risk? And we're talking about stuff even before you get to the implementer to actually put this into practice. So, you know, my, my best practice, what I would recommend to every single ASA customer. What's your endpoint? And then start talking to a lot of different customers, sorry, partners, about what they might bring to the table and do that through a discerning eye. Can you get me there? Are the the people that you put in front of me, because I think at the end of the day, this is still very people-based, are going to talk about AI tools and technologies that can accelerate this, but it's still a people-based business. So the people you're putting in front of me, are they the ones who are actually going to do the work? Or are they handing it off to an offshore firm? Are they where is it going? Right. And if it's going someplace else and this person's here for the sales call, but then they're going to disappear, I've got risk. I've got a lot of risk. Am I comfortable that this group, and as I said to you guys a few moments ago, I'm seeing a lot of switching happening where you start off with one partner, you move to another. I'm very focused on implementation expertise at this moment, right? You start off with one, you move to another. That to me says we as a customer community are not going into these conversations understanding what we're asking for. You're also not going into the conversation having a having a good set of metrics by which right. one can measure the quality good. in the in in the partner community. And I think that's that's a that's a big big open problem and you know you, you both know I I had a dog in that fight at one point um which didn't work because I think that you know fundamentally you know, everyone thinks that, you know, metrics and measurement are a great idea until you tell them that, you know, it pertains to them as well. And then they, they run for the hills. But at the end of the day, I think more and more, again, whether this is something SAP deigns to provide or whether it's something ASA can provide or, or someone else, we need a way of really measuring and tracking quality because it is, you know, the, the great thing about, you know, the, the, the accelerating velocity of business today is that it accelerates success and it accelerates failure at equally, you know, in, intense rates. And if you screw it up, as you've alluded to several times, the possibility of, you know, depending on the size of the company, switching horses midstream can be, a, you know, can be a near fatal experience. Um, and so it's, you know, I, th- I think that <laughs> the ability to have some, some way to measure quality is still desperately needed here. As as I've always said, Josh, what differentiates the world of SAP from other other worlds of software? What differentiate the biggest differentiator in my mind is the people in this ecosystem. Sorry, John. Um, ouch. Careers, careers are at stake here. If you make a couple of these bad moves, you may find that you are not at your employer any longer, right? Because there's a lot of money in stake in these implementations. But that's only one factor of it. Argue, it. I'm sorry. I got to push back at that. I did this in front of your executive exchange more than once. How many people in this room have been I- involved in a bad implementation? Raise your hands. One. How many of them? Keep, keep your arms up now. Two. Keep your arms up. Three, four, five. Everyone's been around these this this yeah show for years, and they've not been held accountable. That to me is 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 uh, the, you, is the, the, the dirty you, little secret. No, 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 no. You asked, the, you, you didn't ask the follow on question. How many of you are still at this, that, at bad implementation one? Are you still, are you still employed there? Two, not, are you I'm still employed, employed there? 
Yeah, have you I updated? Mean, have you updated your LinkedIn profile? Um, look at I the wanna... amount of movement that's happening yes. in LinkedIn right. across right. across all these leaders. It's immense. Yeah, I want to get back to metrics and and customer success in our advice section at the end here. Um, but I do want to point out that part of this also, Josh, is is that Project Health really needs to be a, a continuing uh, measurement, not something that happens. That. Yeah, you you know, but. You know, I just think it's interesting because I talked with a services partner about this that feels they have developed some really good, like, ongoing health ass- health assessments. And they were like, should should we do this or should, you know, SAP do this in this case? And I'm like, well, both. Like, ultimately, the Ven- SAP needs to assume some responsibility for this and not leave it on partners. But at the same time, if partners have some really good innovations here around helping their customers be successful, then more power to them. And the more of that partners, you know, in our advice to partners thing, that would be part of my advice, which we're going to get to in a little bit is, is that's the kind of stuff you should be building to help with that project delivery. But Jeff, I want to put you on the spot just real quick, a little more on ASOC, because I know that you are looking hard at the role of partners in events and, and how do you meaningfully engage? So, so I guess my question for you is, Customers are asking you for advice on which kind of partners. So kind of what do you do about that? Like, how do you help customers either through like showcasing certain kinds of partners at events? How do you avoid the sales pitches and make sure that we're getting into the nitty gritty? Um, h- how do you sort of manage that? Because partners are members too, right? So how do you get the good dialogue going that we all want to have? So... Uh... It's a great question. The first thing I think about is large events like Sapphire and ASUG Annual Conference coming up in June and just a few weeks out, John. What I would encourage customers to do at an event like that is not just go meet with all of your standard relationship partners that you've had for years, and there's a lot of those meetings going on. Take an objective to go meet three or four new partners you've never met before and actually have a really strong heart-to-heart conversation with them. What do you do? What are you really good at? Do you have a referenceable customer that, that you have that I can speak to? Tell me what business value you were able to attain. Don't, just, don't, just don't describe the widget. Describe the business outcome that that widget drove. Who can I talk to? Speak. If you, and if, you, if, if that's uncomfortable, then take the next step. I believe that one of the biggest things we offer as ASUG is the community where you belong and you can speak to your peers. Ask your peers, what partners have you been using? Why? Who's really brought you success? right? How did you get to that success? Ask those questions. As ASUG, we are unbiased when it comes to partners. I, I don't have any particular... If you ask me, hey, Jeff, who are their top five partners? I will, I will not share that because every single customer is different. They're responding to different, different things and they have different issues and needs. So it's an impossible question to answer. The best partner for you is the one who can get you to your bi- desired business outcomes in the most efficient way possible. Measure that. And then you know, Josh, that's what you're talking about, right? So we've yeah. talked about a directory, you know, we've, we, and we have them internally. But the directories are directory. It's like yellow pages. Um, remember those? Um, they're only as good as you can really articulate and clearly understand your need. Um, you know, talk to me. Talk to some of the members of the ASUG board. I mean, we all have stories to share about how we found partners. I'm spending a lot more time with the partner ecosystem lately trying to understand their various solutions. And, you know, I, I was at an event recently with a partner and it was, a, it was an amazing event. I left with my head spinning. I was like, oh my God, there's so much going on. How do I make sense of all of this? Right? And I can't imagine what the average customer is going through with all of these bombarding stuff coming at them. It's like, whoa, my head's going to pop off. Um, that, that is part of what's done. I was just at a partner event last week, same ex- identical experience. There's so much to digest. Yeah. That. You know, and that's my job, our job, if you will. In, in I know. Different. And we're the ones who are spinning around, right, Josh? It's like, right. this is our job. And like, oh my God, there's so much going on here. And it's it's amazing the amount of innovation that each of these partners are undergoing, how they're thinking about the future of AI, the amount of stuff they're putting on market, whether it's whether it's scalable or not, is a whole nother conversation for a whole nother day. But it's it's amazing the amount of opportunity out there. How do you shift through it and make sure it really fits your business model? And, and Josh and John, one of the things that we didn't talk about is scale, right? Just because it works in a, in, you know, in a conference room pilot doesn't mean that it works when you actually throw it up and you actually start using it at enterprise scale. 
And that's one of the things that I think, you know, the SAP ecosystem is incredibly good at and bad at at the same time. We all have to manage large scale enterprises running lots of transactions with lots of variability in them, and it has to stand up to that. All right, I want to do, uh, for our closing, I want to do a round of advice to partners and customers. Before I go there, anything, any other issues you guys had to air out? We good. Well, I, I, no, let me let me just say one thing, and you brought it up a little bit, but you know the the issue of 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 what's sort of the runway for the partner, and and where the and how does a customer understand whether this is going to be a this feature I need is going to be a partner feature one day, or or is it going to be an SAP acquisition one day? This is this is a big complicating factor. You know, SAP publishes the, the roadmap explorer. Uh, roadmaps.sap.com, and they sort of push this out as a tool for both customers and partners to kind of see where SAP is going. And it's not what I would do if I had the opportunity to do that, but I think this is a further complication to the whole ecosystem problem. There's that word again, is that we don't really know what the roadmap is and it's, and the roadmaps we have are not necessarily trustworthy or reliable. Things change all the time. Um, but this is a big this is a big issue because if you want to plan that innovation, you want to have that vision, Jeff, that you're talking about, you also need to, it's incumbent on you, the customer, you need to have a sense of where it's going to come from. And I wish it was a little easier to do that. I'll leave it at that. Fair enough. Okay, let's do a round of advice for partners. What do you think partners should do to become more of that trusted partner that SAP customers want? I realize we're casting a wide net with different types of partners, but let's throw out some advice for partners. Uh, John, the one thing that I see over and over again is communicate through the lens of your customer, not through your lens. What do I mean by that? Talk about business outcomes, business results. Talk about the things that are going to matter to your customer that enable them to be able to write a business case and sell that to their CFO, their CEO, and their boards, right? Too often, we have conversations about very narrow things like widgets, and those are interesting. But if I, as a CIO or a chief enterprise architect or, a, or an IT decision maker, can't figure out how to translate that into business value, that's a lot of work for me to do. So help me translate the business value of it, and we'll get further down the road. So for partners, speak in the language of your customers. And there's a lot of time that we as ASUG spend translating to customer language, right? Mm. And, and, and I'll say, yes, what you said, Jeff, is super important. And I will, I'll will i just throw the challenge in, the, in, the, in general, publish me metrics about your success as a partner. Be that partner that really dares to get out there and say, this is how we, how we roll and why, why, we're, why we drive success for our customers. And one of those metrics can be what you just said, Jeff, Here's, here's published data on the value of the innovation we provide, whether that's our value as an implementation partner, our value as an ISV partner, or whatever it is, get out there and particularly do it because you know the big global SIs aren't, aren't going to do it for love nor money. They'll never do that. This is a way to differentiate. And I think it's a, I think, frankly, if you can't publish good data, then... All right. <laughs> Yeah. If you need, you if you need data, use ASUG. We have an amazing research team that is in market all the time coming up with really important me metrics and benchmarks. And the second thing, Josh, to your point, customer stories always win. Over and over again, when we ask our customer base, our members, what do you want to hear? Customer stories lead the way, not partner pitches but customer story. So get to your pitch through the customer story, not as a substitution for it. Very important. And we miss on this all the time. Yeah. Why aren't you co-presenting with your customer instead of going up there on, on your own, right? Let um, the customers be, let the yeah. customers be your, you, you know, your yeah, number one we're, source we're, of, of very... don't have the customers, pull that mirror out and take a long, hard look at it and wonder why you can't get a customer. Testimonials, customer testimonials. Here's how I was able to get to success and the business results I got. Let customers speak the customer to customer language. Let them do it. If you can't, if you can't do it on your own as a partner, let the customers do it for you, which means you need referenceable customers. Great stuff. I want to throw out a few more things that I love to see in partners. Not all of these are easily achievable, but uh, being being an information provider, uh, not not a sales pitcher. Um, 
that is actually not an easy thing to do. It's something you work at. Um, but there's a lot of questions that need answering, a lot of FAQs. Uh, you know, heck, even play around with an AI FAQ if you want. I don't care, but provide information. Um, and secondly, um, no SAP's roadmap inside and out, but then be able to take agnostic stances that, that position you as a true transformation partner for customers. I really like to see that. I love to see industry focus, uh, benchmarking by industry so you can tell customers why they're underperforming in a particular industry based on their peers. And this whole transition of not just taking on all custom work, but advising customers on what custom projects are worthwhile and which are not. And that implies some, uh, obviously, BTP, uh, you know, versatility and ability to build IP and stuff like that. So those are the kinds of things I look for. But I, I realize that I, that's a high bar to say, oh, you can do all of that stuff. But again, what does success look like, I think, is, is, is at the end of this conversation is like, and how are we going to measure it as we go along? And how are we going to make course corrections when we get off track? And if you can answer those questions, to me, you're a very refreshing partner. Well said. Amen. All right. So final advice for customers. Who wants to go on that? Josh. I guess I, I'm just going to turn this around and say demand metrics. Demand data. Demand the stories. What we've just said. Let's turn it around and say, you, you don't, don't come in my office if that sales pitch is just about you. End of story. Three, three pieces of advice from me. One. Know your end state and know it well. What do you want? Number two, broaden your network to make sure you understand who is the potential solution to that. And number three, talk to your peers and get feedback. And I know an organization where you can get all that too. That was Indeed. not meant to be a sales pitch. <laughs> I mean, that was not. No, but it's real. Pitch. It's not even made up. You know, you don't have no. to sell it. Yeah, indeed. And um, you guys covered all all these great points. So I'll just just say one, which is around the metrics thing, which is before you go anywhere, customer partner and SAP all need to agree on how success is going to be measured before you go forward. And if you don't have that agreement, then call in a skilled advisor to do it. And by the way, there are advisors that specialize in negotiation so and contracts. And so keep that in mind as well, that there's a special service that can be provided around that. And, and obviously, you can also contact your user groups, whether you are. And, and for our international listeners, we've talked a lot about ASUG, but obviously, there's other relevant user groups in your regions if you're not in ASUG's region. The point is, connect with your peers. You'll be smarter and better if you know what your peers are doing. Well said. Indeed. I think we're at a stopping point unless you guys want to say something about Orlando. We're about to descend upon this thing for a week of madness, maybe a little bit less for you, Josh, but because I think you're leaving slightly early. But a little early, but yeah, nonetheless. Well, you know, I think Jeff, you said it right in a, mi a few minutes ago. I mean, choose wisely. Be strategic about what you're doing in Orlando. Don't just float around and see what happens. It's it's a unique opportunity if you use it right. Uh, the annual conference um, really, you know, really has a very different feel and different flavor and different cast of characters. Um, don't miss that, honestly. Um, in fact, I think a couple of people on this show are going to be <laughs> be hanging out at the at that as well. But I think I think being very strategic and really really working you know working the show hard is is to your best advantage, particularly now more more than ever. And your organization's best advantage, right? I mean, as we've talked about, I, I am stunned, stunned's not the right word, some word, about how fast this technology cycle is going. And there's, you know, I used to think we were going to slow this down, but it's speeding up. And there, a lot has happened between May of last year and June of this year. And you owe it to yourself, to your professional career, to your organization that employs you. To give them the very best of what they hire you to do, you should be in Orlando to make sure you at the, you're at the top of your game. I don't know what else to tell you if you're a customer. You need to be in Orlando this year because that's where you will learn the most. I don't know where else you're going to go if you're in the SAP ecosystem where you will learn what you potentially could learn in, in June in Orlando. Well, there'll be Tech Connect later, right? Yes. 
But if you're a decision right. maker, start in Orlando yeah. and obviously come to yeah. Tech Connect. Um, well, and, and I, I do have to throw this out because, yes, the one thing that won't be in enough abundance at Orlando, which means you have to cast a wider net, is understanding about the the line of business applications and how they integrate. Uh, Orlando is going to be a lot more focused on S4 HANA and BTP than on the lines of business. So, yep. by the way, also, public public service announcement: Josh wrote a detailed blog post on this topic. On on. Yeah, right. but you, you wrote one on kind of uniting the clans, bringing all the lines of business together. In one yeah, I have a fantasy yeah, that you could do that. But but because that's not going to happen, you as the customer, it's really incumbent on you to go out there, you know, and find where these where these other... Unfortunately, for instance, you know, there's not going to be a success factors conference here in North America. That That's a shame. On the other hand, Spend Connect is coming back to North America this year. So um, SAP is not making it easy. To cast that net, but but after you're done savoring the you know the complexity of of the S four Hana BTP world, you're going to have to also get out there and see what else is important to you. All right. Well, I don't think we solved the partner solar system slash ecosystem today, but I think we had some good takeaways. Let's leave it there, and I'm sure we'll do a recap after the big Orlando blowout. So, looking forward to reuniting then and see what we actually learned. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. you.